You're watching Keystone Science, and what if we removed every single proton from Earth so that we just had this big conglomerate of electrons twirling around for another? Let's find out what the magnetic field of that planet would be, and let's cover some basics. Hello, and welcome back to the show. Today we're going to talk about something we all know about, electricity and magnetism. So, I'm sure many of you have seen this simple example, where we take a bolt, like this one, and we take some wire here. Let's go ahead and just loop it around this guy. Now that we have our bolt wrapped in a coil of wire, we can go ahead and take this and connect it up to a power supply. So what I have here is a DC variable power supply. It goes up to 32 volts, and it can supply up to 10 amps of current. So, let's go ahead and connect it up. Polarity doesn't matter. And right now, with the power turned off, you can see it, it could care less. It could care less about this screw here. There's no attraction whatsoever. So, if we flip this on, now we can see there is 1.16 volts at 10 amps going through this. We can bring it over to the screw. Whoa, -ho -ho, look at that! It's picking it up. And as soon as we flip it off, it turns off. You can see it actually took a little bit of a second, and that's because there's some lag in the magnetic uh, moments inside of the material. Anyways, another example of a fun electromagnet that I'm sure many of you have seen if you've been on this channel for a while is the Microwave Oven Transformer. This little guy has a coil right here, similar to the coils we just wrapped around our little bolt here. You can see it has the coil system, primary coil, and the secondary coil. The way this works inside your microwave is that it's passing current through this primary coil and magnetically inducing current to flow in the secondary coil. And since there are more turns here, it's moving around more electrons per uh, cycle that it goes through. So this is alternating current, it's going and just kind of pushing and pushing and pushing, and so the ratio of the turns is the step up in voltage. So for instance, if we take our microwave oven transformer here, I have it on this cardboard so that it's hopefully going to be uh, eliminating a lot of the sound since these things hum pretty loudly. Let's go ahead and connect up the mains voltage to it. This is of course not plugged in right now because if it was, that'd kill us. So. Let's just go ahead and clip them on here. There's one. In the ideal world, we'd be having tabs that actually fit onto this. But our world is not ideal. There we go. That should have a decent connection. As you can see, there it is. Should have a pretty good connection. It's falling off pretty easily, so we will be careful about that. Now that we have that connected up, let's go ahead and get this power supply out of the way. And let's grab this guy here. This is just an extension alligator clip. We can take this connected to the secondary coil, connect the other end to this screwdriver here, and we are just going to be using this to conduct the high voltage because uh, this stuff can be very, very dangerous. Let's go ahead and put on this glove to give us some insulation. Now, I can take it. Beautiful, wonderful. Let's make sure we're all safe. If I flip this on, whoa, there you go. Look at that beautiful spark. Um, and you can see that sometimes, if I hit it over here for instance, that the plasma is skittering around outside of it. And that is actually caused by the magnetic field being generated by the primary coils, because electrons are pushed around by magnetic fields. We'll talk more about that in a second. Similarly, if I were to just take this guy and lop off the top half of that, we would have a pretty strong magnetic field being generated just from that primary coil. It's being a little bit taken up from that secondary coil right now, but if we were to do that, we'd have a strong magnetic field. Um, in fact, let's try it. Let's try doing that, just for demonstration's sake. Make sure it's unplugged here. I have my welding goggles here, because this can get, this can get pretty bright and a little crazy. So, let's just take this angle grinder, and we will cut the welds in this so we can take out that secondary coil. Let's see how this goes, all right? Oh, geez.
All right. I, wow, I can't hear anymore. Let's go ahead and now just pry it open. I was hoping that it would just bend open at this point. If I get this guy in here. There we go. Screwdriver. It did it. That's fantastic. All right. So we can go ahead and pop him open. Let's try one more time. Nice and easy. This is the power of leverage, right? So we just push it on open here. Now that we have him open, let's get him a little bit more open. You can see that beautiful primary coil. Almost there, almost there. Beautiful, we did it, great. Here is that primary coil. You see, it's just a whole bunch of wires. We're going to take this and this conveniently placed bowl of water, wonder how that got there, and let's take this screw and stick it into some foam. We're just gonna place it in the water. Let's balance the secondary camera so that you guys can see this a little bit more. Um, now, if we take this primary coil and we connect it up to our DC power supply, just as before, if we go ahead and turn on our power supply, we're drawing 7.58 volts at around 10 amps. We can put the coil near here. Let's get a little closer. I should not be dipping that in water. Uh, and you can see that the screw is very attracted to it. If we flip it around, the screw is going to flip itself around, goes out, and is it going to find its way back? Ooh, this is getting real hot. There we go, found its way back. For electromagnets or solenoids, as these guys are called, the equation for their magnetic field is actually very, very simple. So it is B, the magnetic field, is equal to the density of the number of turns, which is just the count like number of turns in a centimeter and then divide it by a centimeter. Uh, multiplied by the current running through it, multiplied by a scalar constant called the magnetic permeability constant, which varies from material to material that it's in. And if it's just in pure vacuum, that is mu naught, which is around 4 pi times 10 to the negative 7, I believe. That's good and all, but why does the flowing electricity produce a magnetic field? To answer that, we have to dive a little bit into special relativity, and there's actually a great video made by uh, Veritasium and Minute Physics that covered just this very topic like seven years ago. And so that's gonna be linked in the description. Highly recommend it. In essence, as they talk about in these other videos, if you have current running inside of a wire and you have a charged particle running next to it, say a positive one, then it will bend away from the wire. And that's because due to length contraction that the protons within the wire are actually closer together than they are from the rest frame, which makes it look like it has a slightly positive charge which repels it. And it is actually opposite for a negative charge. And that can be attributed to either the magnetic field or to just electrical forces. Now we could sit there and talk about that aspect for a very long time because it's so fascinating. However, let's jump on a little bit of a tangent here. A semi-tangent? But not really. Let's talk about how electrons themselves have magnetic fields. So to show that, I have a little bit of demonstration here. Oh man. This is heavy. Uh, it came out of a refrigerator. So this is basically just steel with a little bit of a motor inside and some oil there. So this is a refrigerator's compressor. It's used to cool down the refrigerator to make it nice and cold for you. Because as you compress a gas, it gets hotter since everything's closer together. And then since it's hotter, it can radiate away the heat. And then when it expands back out, then it's colder than it was originally, which allows the refrigerator just to sit there and suck out heat. Anyways, let's go ahead and free up this tube here. This has just been repurposed as a vacuum pump. And let's grab this guy here. He is a Martinelli's bottle. We have a little valve here to shut off the whole bottle from the outside world. And we also have this little hook on the inside. I don't know if you can see that. This little hook to allow a current inside of it. And the other current can be placed on this top part here. So if we just plop the tube over this guy here. Let's go ahead and get our high voltage power supply ready, which we're going to be using this guy here. He is a ZVS driver. Um, I actually just wound this today because my old one uh, broke down a bit. So we have a ZVS driver and let's get our power supply back in here. And the positive part we are going to connect to the hook down here and the negative part we're going to connect to the top. And we're doing this because, um, of course, the charge carrier here is the electron, and that is negatively charged, and so the current is actually flowing down through the tube, down this way, where we have our positive connected up right here, and it's going to be flowing 
from the top, racing towards this positive charge, uh, and we should get a nice stream of plasma. The other way is much less efficient, especially in this orientation. Now, if we just go ahead and flip this, we should be able to see a plasma stream. Um, we're not quite there, looks like. Hmm? There we are. That's going to be hard to see. Let me go ahead and turn off the lighting. Okay, now I can see it definitely on the, on the laptop screen. We have a beam of plasma shooting down through the tube. If I turn down the voltage, it'll get a little bit less intense. And you start to see these, these little clusters of plasma. Those are quite beautiful. I actually have a whole video on this. This is called a cathode ray tube that will be linked in the description if you want to watch it and learn a little bit more. Uh, but it's just fascinating. Anyways, this is a pure stream of electrons jetting through the chamber. We have to do this fast because this bottle is getting hot and I don't know how much it can take. Let's actually turn down the power just in case. If I take this magnet here and bring it near, you can see that we are pushing, we can just sit there and push the plasma stream along. It's kind of fun. It's kind of fun because the flowing electron, each individual one is affected by the magnet. If I flip it around, you can see now I'm kind of pulling it towards me. This one pushes it um, to the right. This one actually pushes it to the left, which you can kind of see here if I, I don't know, it's a little bit hard since it's already starting off at the, at the end of the tube, but I can push it to the right and then I can push it to the left, to the right, and to the left. The flow of the electrons through the magnetic field in this vacuum chamber can be relatively well characterized using something called the right hand rule, which is a rule that characterizes how a moving charged particle behaves in a magnetic field. So if we take our right hand here and orient it in these three 90 degree angles, these three orthogonal axes, then the thumb represents the current, the middle finger represents the magnetic field, and the index finger represents the force that the charged particle feels. And actually, you use your right hand to represent positively charged particles, and the left hand to represent negatively charged particles. So here, the electron's the charge carrier, so we're going to be using our left hand. And if we take that, and orient our thumb in the direction of the current, which was that way, and our middle finger as the direction of the magnet we are holding up to it, then we see that the electrons are feeling a force to my right or your left, and that is actually what we observed. And if we flip the magnetic field as we did, like this, I kind of have to break my wrist for this one, then the force is in the opposite direction, which is also what we observed. So that is a very nice nifty trick for determining how particles move in a magnetic field and something that's uh, pretty fun to flash around to people. Anyways, quick disclaimer actually, because now is as good of a time as I need to say it. High voltage, pretty freaking dangerous. Um, this is a ZVS driver, as I said before. I have to say, I don't recommend that you play around with these at home. Um, just even today, I have actually burned quite a few little, little dots in my fingers from this guy. So I'll show you what kind of power this thing is outputting. So here we are with the 21 volts. See this beautiful, beautiful plasma. And at this point we can already can already blow on it and get this amazing array here. And cranking it all the way up to the top of my power supply, you can see this amazing arc. Like look at that. That's some that's some pretty scary stuff actually. Man, and this whole thing is just getting destroyed on the left hand side because of how hot it's getting. I've actually never gotten shocked this at full power. It is it is quite scary though. So be careful around this stuff. That is the that's the point of the statement. Anyways, a fun little piece we have here is a miniature cathode ray tube television. So this is how TVs used to work. Ooh, operating on these very principles of bending electrons by magnets. So if we connect this up to our high voltage supply here, let me Go ahead and do that. Place this guy. Ooh, he is, he's toasty. He's toasty, I should have thought that through. Beautiful, there's a little dot. If you look at it, we have just the little electron traveling down, right? The little electron that could. He's traveling down and interacting with the end of the screen. You can see as I bring the magnet down here, whoop, we get the electron to move that way. And what does that tell us? Let's apply our principle of analysis here. So the current is going in that direction. Let's actually use a left hand rule. The current is going in that direction, right? The index finger is for force. So the force is going that way. So the magnetic field 
must be pointed away, which means that we are actually putting the south side down um, in order to be deflecting it to the right, while the north side is deflecting it to the left, as you can see. And if I actually put it now turned the other way, we can get it to go up and down. So the amazing thing about these old televisions is that it uses a little electromagnet on the back. It has these two coils, which I'll show you in just a second, in order to deflect the electron to scan down the entire uh, television screen in order to illuminate every pixel with the correct intensity. So that's pretty fun. That's pretty amazing. Speaking of pretty fun and pretty neat, is the sponsor of today's video, Flixpix. Movie night should not be the most stressful night of the week. We've all been there when the, I don't know, you choose, takes up 30 minutes of the group's time. It's even harder when streaming services get involved. Does this movie cost money? Uh, is it still available on Netflix? Why does Hulu keep showing me the same 10 movies over and over? Introducing Flixpix, the best app in the world for helping you to choose a movie by yourself for a date night or with a big group. Start by going on the app and creating a group. Then pick streaming services, genres, and MPAA ratings that you want to be included in your options. Once everyone else has joined the group on their respective devices, you start swiping. Swipe left or right to show your interest in a movie, and simply tap the card to get more information on it. You can check the top scores at any time to see what movie got the most votes. And just in case a movie that looked interesting to you didn't get chosen by the group, you can always see a history of your likes in the app. It's a match! Flix picks. what are we watching tonight? And between you and me, since I developed this entire app, if you find any bugs, please let me know. And if you like it, leave a good rating on the iOS and Android store, because that really helps. To go back to our original question, what is the electrical current of the Earth? That's a little bit of a loaded question, of course, because what exactly do I mean by that? Uh, as a simple case, what if we were to take Earth and have only the electrons and keep that in the same motion of the Earth rotating? Then what would the magnetic field and current be of that object? So, if our Earth was just a collection of electrons all spinning the same way that Earth does now, then what would be the magnetic field? Well, the first thing we have to figure out is the current. So, current is defined as um, amperes, which is defined as basically coulombs per second. All right, so we need to figure out the charge that passes through a given um, flux Per second. So let's choose our domain to be this little slice of Earth. So you can imagine here is our entire sphere, right? We are just taking this little slice. So to figure out the electrons passing through that per second, we need the number of electrons, which on Earth actually tends to be around 1.75 times 10 to the 51 electrons. That is the number of electrons on Earth. And to figure out that per second, that is divided by 24 times 60 times 60. Um, which is equal to around 2.02 times 10 to the 46th. So that is how many electrons would flow through this per second. Yes, that is how many electrons will flow through that per second. Great. Let's take that number now and let's turn that into coulombs. So we take 2.02 times 10 to the 46th and we divide it by the definition of the coulomb which is approximately 6.241 times 10 to the 18th. And actually we have another factor of two here because it passes through um, the same kind of flux slice per day twice. So doing this, I am just going to disregard this notation here since we're just talking big orders of magnitude. None of this is even precise. And let's turn that into, let's see, 46 minus 18 is roughly 28. Not roughly, it is 28. So that is 10 to the 28 coulombs per second that flow through our system. Great. So given that, that means the current is roughly 10 to the 28 amps. Um, I probably messed up a little bit there. Uh, let's say plus or minus one. Great, that probably, that probably encapsulates everything. So, given that that's the current, the magnetic field is defined as B, which is notation for the magnetic field, is equal to mu times the current divided by two pi r. Let's exist in terms of times 10 notation again. So let's use mu naught, since this would be an empty space. We're only keeping onto the electrons. Mu naught, which is the permittivity of a magnet in empty space, is equal roughly to four pi times 10 to the negative seven. So we have 10 to the negative seven effectively multiplied 
by our current, which is 10 to the 28, divided by the radius of the Earth, which is roughly 6,000 kilometers, which is roughly 10 to the 6th. Great! So these two can combine together, and we basically have 10 to the uh, 13th on the bottom. 28 minus 13 is 10 to the 15. So we would have roughly 10 to the 15 Teslas that this electron sphere Earth would be generating. Now, to put into context how absurdly high this magnetic field strength is, the strongest magnetic field that humans generally interact with are from MRI machines, and that only ranges from around 0.2 to 3 teslas, and the Earth's magnetic field at the surface is only around 70 microteslas, that's 70 times 10 to the negative 6th, so this is orders and orders of magnitude greater than those. If you were to try to recreate this magnetic field strength with refrigerator magnets, it would take 10 million billion refrigerator magnets. That's not only them stacking across America or around the world, but at 20 millimeter thickness, that is going 100 of our solar system diameters. In fact, if you were to take a coin and flip it on the surface of this world, the coin would instantly evaporate into the highest energy plasma you can imagine due to all the eddy currents forming within it. So you'd probably not have a very good time here. But you may be wondering, why can I flip a coin on the surface of Earth? I mean, certainly there are the same number of electrons and they're all moving around exactly as we described, so, why doesn't it evaporate? And that answer comes down to symmetry. You see, for roughly every electron that exists on Earth, there exists a proton. And due to that right-hand rule that we were talking about before, right hand for positive charges, left hand for negative charges, right hand for proton, left hand for electron, with the current moving in the same direction, the magnetic fields of the electron and the proton cancel each other out. And that's pretty amazing, because that means we have this giant tug-of-war happening. On one hand, the electrons are producing a giant, monstrous magnetic field. But on the other hand, the protons are producing an equal and opposite magnetic field, both perfectly cancelling out to zero. And that's beautiful. So, thank you guys for watching. Please remember to be safe and have a wonderful day. I'll see you guys next time. You're watching Keystone Science, and in today's episode, we're going to measure the wavelength of light using an interferometer.